Hello, my name is Paul Effort. I work as a building stone scientist for the British Geological Survey. Hope you've been enjoying this year's virtual Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival. I'm here today at Colton Hill to take you on a tour to show how geology has fashioned both the stunning landscape and built heritage of Edinburgh. Both geology and human history, hand in hand, have contributed so much to Edinburgh's unique character. There are few better places to explore this than Calton Hill, one of Edinburgh's most prominent public parks. Everywhere you look here, you're surrounded by history. Our story today begins around 350 million years ago. We can see this far back into the past by looking at places where the bedrock is exposed, such as right here by the path. These rocks are literally a window into the past. This speaks of a violent past, because these were produced by large volcanic eruptions. You can see here, this layer of rocks, very loose and easy to fragment. And that's because it's made up of lots and lots of pieces of volcanic ash, which have been erupted by a volcano. There are also some harder cobble or boulder sized pieces of rock, which represent volcanic bombs. These would be large burning chunks of rock that were thrown high into the air by a volcano before settling into the volcanic muds. These would have been originally quite loose, muddy materials, but since being buried they've then solidified a bit more into rock. Overlying all of this volcanic ash is a completely solid horizon of rock. This is also the result of volcanic eruptions except this layer of rock is a lava flow. So this was once literally a river of molten rock. Completely molten rocks that had the chance to cool end up being very, very hard, formed of lots of interlocking crystals with no spaces in between. The final thing that we can see on this outcrop is that these rocks originally, when they were deposited, would have been horizontal. But you can see now they're tilted. Tilting has occurred due to earth movements, deep packed in geological time, which has shifted the rocks from the horizontal to angled. The city of Edinburgh possesses some of the finest sandstone buildings in the world and is set among spectacular scenery. Once known as the Athens of the North, Edinburgh is also said, like Rome, to be built on seven hills Colton Hill, Herstorfen Hill, Craig Lockhart Hill, the Castle Hill. Braid Hills, Blackford Hill and Arthur's Seat. What links all of these hills is their igneous or volcanic origin. Many of them used to be the cores of ancient volcanoes, like for example the Castle Hill. The rock on which it sits on was formerly the centre of a volcanic pipe, literally the inner plumbing of a volcano. Tons and tons of molten rock would have been lifted up through that pipe and out on the surface. The plug now, as the volcano vol volcanism has, has left us, the, the rock now consists of a circular plug of a hard igneous rock called dolerite. So during the Carboniferous period, when these volcanoes were active, around 360 to 300 million years ago, the environment where Edinburgh was was very different much more like, for example, the Gulf of Mexico. The land subsided and was therefore taken over by the sea, which formed lagoons. Rivers flowed out and into the sea, depositing sand and forming large river deltas. This deltas then gradually formed new land, in which dense forests thrived. Repeated cycles of this story of subsidence, river sands and forests created cycles of different sedimentary strata. Where in particular those strata consisted of sand, we ended up with some very fine sandstone resources which have then been exploited for Edinburgh's architecture. For most of the last 250 million years ago, this area has been dry land. Large rivers generally washed from the north of Scotland down towards the North Sea and the southeast of England, which was sea at that time. For most of the last two million years or so, 
Edinburgh, as well as most of the northern UK, has been covered in ice during repeated ice ages. Each time, glaciers from the north of Scotland would flow south, and glaciers from the south of Scotland would flow north. They then met in the middle in the Midland Valley and flowed east towards Edinburgh. So this huge weight of ice was pressing down on the landscape and eroded out valleys. The ice shaped the landscape, eroding the soft sandstone strata while leaving the hard volcanic cores as hills. This is really evident around Castle Hill, which has what's called a crag and tail shape. It has steep cliffs around the west side, which were worn against by the ice, but a long gently sloping tail to the east in the lee of the ice floor. And that's why the Royal Mile gently slopes in an easterly direction. As the ice was forced over the heart rock plug of the castle crag, but preserving the soft strata in the tail. The ice was forced around the side and formed hollows, which became lochs when the ice melted. For example, the Nor Loch, which occupied the land where Princess Street Gardens is now, and the Borough Loch, which is now the Meadows, and was drained around 800 years ago. The landscape then shaped the history and development of the town, which grew up in medieval times around the Castle Hill, where it was, this was favoured for defence. The Nor Loch was then later drained and the new town was built. And as defence was less important, other than Castle Hills, other hills were not built on in favour of flatter land. Today, Colton Hill boasts an outstanding collection of buildings and monuments and offers fantastic views across the city. But it wasn't always like this. Back in medieval times, Colton Hill was very different, very much existed on the fringes of society. Originally used for sheep grazing, a Carmelite friary was established for monks who really wanted to keep away from the rest of town. The Carmelite friary eventually became a leper colony, and part of the land there was known as Hangman's Acre. There was a gallows on each corner of the acre, and with the instructions that any lepers found escaping were to be hung immediately. In the 1760s, Colton Hill was in use for quarrying and as a bleaching ground. But it rose to prominence in the 1760s with the creation of Edinburgh's new town. Cotton Hill was seen as the new town's equivalent to Castle Hill. So we're now going to take a look at Old Observatory House. This is the oldest building on Cotton Hill, dating from 1776. It was built by James Craig, planner of Edinburgh's new town. Its design was in response to the famous architect Robert Adam who thought that because Cotton Hill was to be the equivalent of Castle Hill, the old observatory house should take the form of a fortifications. The city observatory here is another highly significant building on Cotton Hill. Built between 1818 and 1822 for the Astronomical Institution, one of the first societies purely devoted to the pursuit of astronomy. The president of the Astronomical Institution was John Playfair. He commissioned his son, the famous architect William Playfair, to build the observatory. For me, this is actually one of the most special buildings in all of Edinburgh because of the way it was designed and built. William Playfair specified that every single block of the observatory was to be built from the famous Craigley sandstone and was to be shaped as precisely possible and placed with almost no mortar in between the joints of the masonry blocks. In addition, the building has no foundations and in fact they, when they built it they scraped the ground right the way down to flat bedrock and then placed blocks of the, of the building directly on top. You might think that for an observatory they'd want a tall building that they could look out for. But in actual fact, it was designed to be as low to the ground as possible. And all of this was to make sure that it would limit the vibrations that would pass through the building as they were looking through the telescopes, so it wouldn't throw off any of their observations. These observations were very important at the time, because not only did the astronomers look to be exploring the skies, but they also used their astronomical observations to set the time for the city, and importantly, for the shipping below in the Firth of Forth. 
Knowing the exact time on a boat at that time was very important because it was absolutely critical for naval navigation. This is Playfair's Monument. It was built in 1826 by William Playfair to commemorate his uncle, John Playfair. It sits in the corner of the boundary walls of the City Observatory and is said to represent the literal cornerstone of the observatory. It's a Greek Doric style monument built with gravely sandstone. And you can see just how crisp the carvings are at the top are. And this is a testament to the strength, quality of the stone and the skill of the masons who built it. According to Playfair's original drawings, the centre of the monument is hollow, but there's no access or doorway in. So what remains inside is a mystery. here are another example of how geology surrounds us in Calton Hill. They've all been gathered by the, in, are in the turning circle to form a feature, but they would have originally been distributed throughout the tail of Calton Hill. And these boulders are glacial boulders that have been transported long distances by large glacial rivers of ice. And as the glaciers melted, they would have been deposited. All that tumbling around in ice for millennia has caused them to be so rounded. And that's a typical feature of glacial boulders. So this building here is known as the City Dome. It was built much later, in 1896, by Robert Moran. It was built when the Royal Observatory moved to Blackford Hill to get away from the light of the cities and this observatory was taken over by the city. It's an octagonal building with a copper dome and it was built to house a much larger telescope than could fit in the city observatory. It's made of a sandstone from Binny Quarry in West Lothian. And it's very different from the Craig Leith sandstone that we saw previously. It weathers to this orange colour and also to can, in some cases, develop a black crust. The same type of stone was used for the Scott Monument, which is characteristically blackened. This is due to hydrocarbon material that was within the stone, which gradually migrates towards the surface. The city dome doesn't feature so much of this blackening, so it's possible that it's been cleaned during the past. This is Nelson's Monument. It was built between 1807 and 1816 by the architect Robert Byrne and also uses Craig Leith sandstone. It was dedicated to Lord Nelson for his victory at Trafalgar and it's designed in the shape of an inverted telescope as befitting the Great Admiral. This actually predates Nelson's Monument in Trafalgar Square by about 30 years or so, and it's set as the highest point of the hill. That's also because it was to serve a very important function. It was intended to be a signals mast for ships down in Leith. In 1852, the time ball on the top of the monument was added. It dropped at one o'clock and enabled captains who were in their ships in the river Forth to set their, set their chronometer from the deck of their ship. Near the top of the monument, you can see some blocks that have been more recently repaired. They stand out quite clearly as they haven't yet weathered to the same extent as the rest of the masonry. In the next part of this video, I'm going to explain how geology comes in to help select the right replacement stone for stone repairs like this. When selecting a new stone for repair to a historic building, following questions need to be asked. What does the original stone consist of? Where did it come from? Can we get more of the same? And if not, what's the next best thing? At the BGS, we use geological information and techniques to help to answer these questions. The most important technique is petrographic analysis, 
looking at stone underneath the microscope. To do this, we first have to prepare a thin section of the stone. This is a very, very thin slice that's been glued to a microscope slide. Before it's attached to the slide, it's the pore spaces of the sandstone are impregnated with a blue dye resin so that they're visible. So here's what our sample of Craigley's sandstone looks like underneath the microscope. The image on my monitor measures about three millimetres across in reality. We can see the blue pore space and also the other sand grains which are white and grey. If we zoom in very closely, we can see that most of the sand grains have very strong contacts between them. And this is what makes Craigleith such a strong and durable stone. We can also see that the majority of these sand grains are quartz, which appears white underneath the microscope. Quartz is the most durable and strong of the common minerals that you find in sandstones. And this is what makes Craigleith such a high quality sandstone for building. You can also see that all of the grains are very even similar size. This really helps it to be tooled and shaped evenly by masons. The petrographic characteristics, i.e. the grain scale composition and properties of a stone affect how it performs. So for stone repairs, we want to identify and use a matching stone that's as similar as possible. Petrographic analysis is really important for this because two stones that may look the same visually might have very different properties. Here's an example which shows this. The sample on the left is from the masonry of an A-listed building in Edinburgh. The square block in the middle was the stone type originally proposed for repairs to it. And visually, it looks pretty similar. However, when we examine these stone types under the microscope, we can see that they have very different petrographic characteristics. We were able to identify a better match, the stone on the right, which could be sourced from the same quarry as the stone that was originally used in the building. Using a poor match can prove costly if the replacement stone proves to be incompatible with the existing masonry. The new stone may look similar, but it might have a contrasting permeability, for example. This can inhibit the transmission of moisture through the, the masonry of the building, and the moisture can then become trapped in either the new stone or the original stone and cause it to decay. This picture shows a close-up of one block that is causing decay to the surrounding stone. But here's a more extreme example where significant volumes of an incompatible stone were introduced to a historic building, which is now showing significant deterioration as a result. When we are asked for advice on stone matching for building repairs, we compare both the visual and petrographic properties of a sample of stone from the building with those of reference samples held in the BGS collection of UK building stones. We do this to identify the original source and the closest matches. This is the most extensive collection of building stones in the UK and is a key resource which allows us to complete this work. It contains several thousand samples from disused and currently active quarries with the accompanying thin sections. BGS has been in existence for over 185 years. Unfortunately, BGS geologists collected samples when quarries that are now buried were still in production. Our collections and resources in BGS means that we're uniquely placed to identify where a building stone came from and identify the best matches. We can help with advice on stone selection for repairs to any stone structure and much more besides.
only the part that had intimately and had accurate measurements of it. The detailed working drawings and execution of the monument were again by William Playfair, who served as the site architect. There's an interesting historical context to the National Monument of Scotland. After the Napoleonic Wars, the British Empire emerged as the largest empire in the world, which was ruled from its capital, London, or the New Rome. So Edinburgh's role was to be part of that empire, but to remain, retain its own identity and status. Thus, Edinburgh was the Athens of the North against London's Rome. The project to make the National Monument of Scotland was hugely ambitious, overly so. Originally, they intended to create an entire replica of the whole building of the Parthenon, but only half of the money that was needed was, was collected. The building of the, of the monument was abandoned in 1829, and it quickly became known as Edinburgh's disgrace. However, it's still a very striking addition to the Edinburgh skyline, and I think few today would consider it to be a disgrace. Interestingly, William Playfair's drawings show the monument as it is now, without the rest of the Parthenon built onto it. It's as though he almost knew that it was overly ambitious and would never be completed. In 1823, a massive block of sandstone from Craigleaf Quarry, weighing 1,500 tonnes, was carted in pieces to form the lintels on top of the monument. This was the largest block of stone ever quarried in Scotland. They needed 12 horses and 70 men to carry the blocks up to the top of the hill. Few quarries have ever been able to produce blocks even a quarter of this size, so it's a ten, again a testament to the quality of the resource that was there at Craigleaf. Craigleaf Quarry in the west of Edinburgh was the largest and best known of Edinburgh's quarries and supplied stone for many of the buildings and monuments from Colton Hill. It was active since at least the 17th century and is known to have supplied stone to Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace. Later on, it was used extensively for the construction of the Edinburgh Newtown and supplied huge quantities of stone in the 18th and 19th centuries. The quarry had a worldwide reputation for producing building stone of the highest quality and even exported stone to London, Europe and the United States. All in all, the quarry was active for over 300 years and the final massive hole had faces 110 metres high. The last major project for which Craigleith stone was used was for Leith Docks in 1895. There was some intermittent quarrying during the 20th century, but quarrying essentially ceased during the First World War. It's now infilled with Craigleith Retail Park on top, opened in 1993. But this photo gives a sense of its former size. In this part of Cotton Hill, we get a fantastic view of Arthur's Seat, situated in Hollywood Park. Of all of Edinburgh's hills, Arthur's Seat is the tallest and is also the best preserved volcano. Arthur's Seat was, in fact, the core of the volcano that produced the volcanic rocks that we saw today on Cotton Hill. Erosion has cut deep into the heart of the volcano, laying open its inside structure. The central vents at the hill's summit are visible, as well as layered lava flows formed the slopes of Quinney Hill to the east. These would have been part of the slopes that formed the volcano's core. The vent itself is represented by rocks called vent agglomerate, a mixture of blocks of lava and volcanic ash which fill the open vent at the top of the volcano. This is in contrast to Castle Hill, which is the volcano's pipe, and it is part of the deep plumbing of the volcano. In actual fact, the volcano on Castle Hill was thought to have been much larger than the one of Arthur's Seat. Cotton Hill is also a fragment of the Arthur's Seat volcano cone, which has been since displaced and moved out of place by fault movement before glaciation occurred. The other prominent geological feature in Hollywood Park is Salisbury Crags. I personally think it's the single most stunning landscape feature in Edinburgh. Salisbury Crags is also made of volcanic rock, but in fact it's not directly related to the Arthur's Seat volcano. The crags are actually around 285 million years old and are associated with renewed volcanic activity in the Permian period. 
Salisbury Crags is what's known as a sill, an eruption of volcanic rock that didn't quite make it to the surface. It's not easy for molten rock to get to the surface without being diverted. Salisbury Crags is an example where molten igneous rock was squeezed between two layers of sedimentary rock at the top and the bottom of the sill. When that molten rock cooled, it then also contracted, leading to a vertical jointing pattern. This is very much like the jointing pattern that you have in the Giant's Causeway, except in Salisbury Crags, you're seeing it side on. The sill is made of a hard volcanic rock called dolerite. This is a grey to black volcanic rock composed of fine interlocking crystals with no pore space in between. Being fine grained, uniform and very hard, dolerite is ideal for building kerbstones. Indeed, Salisbury Crags was quarried in the 17th century for building stone and paving for Edinburgh as well as elsewhere. Some was even sent to London. Between 1815 and 1819 almost 50,000 tonnes of rock were removed but in 1831 people protested and the crags were eventually protected by order of the House of Lords.